It's the first reading from 1 Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 to 12. When the ark of the Lord had been in Philistine territory seven months, the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners and said, What shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us how we should send it back to its place. They answered, If you return the ark of the God of Israel, do not send send it back to him without a gift. By all means, send a guilt offering to him. Then you will be healed, and you will know why his hand has not been lifted from you. The Philistines asked, What guilt offering should we send to him? They replied, Five gold tumours and five gold rats, according to the number of the Philistine rulers, because the same plague has struck both you and your rulers. Make models of the tumours and of the rats that are destroying the country and give glory to Israel's God. Perhaps he will lift his hand from you and your gods and your land. Why do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh did when Israel's God dealt harshly with them? Did they not send the Israelites out so they could go on their way? Now then, get a new cart ready with two cows that have calved and have never been yoked. Hitch the cows to the cart and take their calves away and pen them. Take the ark of the Lord and put it on the cart and in the chest beside it put the gold objects you are sending back to him as a guilt offering. Send it on its way but keep watching it. If it goes up to its own territory towards Beth Shemesh then the Lord has brought this great disaster on us. But if it does not, then we will know that it, has not, that it was not his hand that struck us, but that it happened by, to us by chance. So they did this. They took two cows and hitched them to the cart and penned up their calves. They placed the ark of the Lord on the cart and along with it the chest containing the gold rats and the models of the tumours. Then the cows went straight up towards Beth Shemesh keeping on the road and lowing all the way. They did not turn to the right or to the left. The rulers of the Philistines followed them as far as the border of Beth Shemesh. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Gospel reading today is from Matthew chapter 4 verses 1 to 11. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray as we come to God's word together. Our Father, we thank you for your daily provision. And we thank you for feeding us with physical food uh, and in so many other ways. And we pray that now you will feed us by your word uh, so that we might grow in our love for Jesus. And we pray in his name. Amen. 
yesterday I discovered something that could change the world. Did you know that there is a day called Eat Ice Cream for Breakfast Day? <laughs> Did you know that? It's a real thing. Uh, it's not complicated. What's that? There you go. Uh, there are three ingredients to this particular day. Eat ice cream, got that, on the first Saturday in February for breakfast. Um, you can look it up on the internet. It's, it's a real thing. And uh, today, of course, is Mother's Day. Did anyone have ice cream for breakfast? With waffles? With pancakes? It's Mother's Day. You can do whatever you like. Um, you can come and tell me afterwards. Uh, ice cream is usually too good to resist. And advertisers know that we're not very good at resisting the temptation of a sweet treat. Do you remember a few years ago there was a Magnum ice cream called the Magnum Temptation? Hmm. Well, we continue our series this morning from Matthew's Gospel. It's called Kingdom Come. And today we come to Jesus in the wilderness being tempted by Satan, which raises all kinds of questions for us. How could Jesus be tempted? If he's the Son of God, was this temptation real? Does he understand what temptation is like for us? What purpose does all this serve? How was he able to resist the devil's temptation? Now, we might have a bit of a laugh at Magnum Temptation ice cream. When it comes to ice cream or donuts, or whatever, giving in to temptation is probably, in the scheme of things, insignificant, unless you've got some major health issues. But there are times when temptation, desires, resisting really does matter, when it's a much bigger deal than an ice cream. Can we resist temptation? And knowing that Jesus resisted temptation, what difference does that make? Last week we saw the beginning of Jesus' ministry as John the Baptist called Israel back to repentance calling the Jewish people to turn back to God. And baptism was a sign of that repentance. And then Jesus was baptised by John, not because he needed to repent of sin, but to show that he identified with his people Israel. He came in their place. He came for them in order to take their place and die in their place. And so we see Jesus baptised and we're so thankful because it shows that he is for us. And after Jesus is baptised, his mission is confirmed with those wonderful words from his heavenly Father, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. And then from that high point, the next words in Matthew's Gospel deliver a hammer blow. Matthew 4 verse 1, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Jesus goes out into the wilderness, into the desert, to be tempted by the devil. And you notice that Jesus was led by the Spirit. The same Spirit who had descended on him like a dove at his baptism, affirming his ministry, now leads him out to be tempted. So this is not outside of God's control. In fact, Jesus' temptation is part of God's plans, part of his purpose for Jesus. And if we can come to grips with why this was part of God's plan, then we'll begin to understand that his temptation was actually central to his mission. The second thing to notice is that Jesus would be tempted by the devil. The devil is real. We ignore him at our peril. But it's also possible to be needlessly scared of him and give him more power than he deserves. Finally, Jesus was led out to be tempted. Now that might raise a question or two. You might remember in James chapter 1, it says that God doesn't tempt anyone. So if God doesn't tempt anyone, how do we square that with what we see here in Matthew's Gospel? In what sense is Jesus led out to be tempted? Well, a couple of things to say. First, the word that we translate tempted can mean tested. 
The Bible's very clear that God tests us. In the Old Testament book of Job, God allows Satan to test Job. In the New Testament, even uh, here in the letter of James, it's very clear that trials or tests, it's the same word as here in Matthew 4, it's clear that trials will come, that our faith will be tested. Jesus' temptation or testing in the wilderness is real and it's not at odds with Scripture elsewhere because God does sometimes allow his people and even his own beloved son to be tested, tempted. Yeah, have you ever skipped a meal or two? Maybe before surgery or something like that? Matthew tells us that Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Now you might be thinking that a day or two is plenty. 40 sounds impossible. Uh, experts tell us that it is possible that there was a kind of fast that allowed water only. It's quite possible to survive 40 days. If you get far beyond that, you might run into some problems. But Matthew tells us that at the end of 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus was hungry. I'm not surprised. And it's when Jesus is hungry, after 40 days and 40 nights of fasting, it's when he's at his weakest that the devil attacks him. Jesus' first temptation is to doubt God's goodness. Look with me at chapter 4 of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, verse 3. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. You see, the devil, the tempter, doesn't question Jesus' status of the son of, as the Son of God. That's already been confirmed back at Jesus' baptism. But what the devil does is cast doubt on God's goodness. Tell these stones to become bread. In other words, you're hungry. Do you really trust God to provide for you? Can't you provide for yourself? See, Satan takes that legitimate need, the very human need for food, and he uses it to tempt Jesus to take matters into his own hands. And Jesus could have done it. Jesus could have told stones to become bread. Just a few chapters later in Matthew's Gospel, the disciples bring to Jesus, remember, five loaves of bread and two fish, and Jesus feeds an entire crowd, more than 5,000 people. Jesus is able to make bread from stones even. And so after 40 days and 40 nights without food, he must have been hungry. He must have been weak. And you can imagine it must have been tempting to just feed himself. But that's not why Jesus came. He came not for himself, not to fulfil his own needs, but for us. He came not to serve his own purposes, but to serve you and me. And his mission meant taking our place, dying in our place for our sins. The temptation was to use his sonship in a way that was inconsistent with his mission. And Jesus resisted that temptation. Listen to his answer to the devil. Uh, it's there in verse 4. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So Jesus resists temptation. He answers the devil by quoting scripture. He quotes from the Old Testament, from the book of Deuteronomy. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. In other words, there are more important things than bread. There are things that are more important to Jesus than feeding himself. What's more important, in fact, Jesus says it's a matter of life and death, is hearing and being sustained by God's word. And it's worth noticing that with each of these three temptations, Jesus answers the devil each time from Scripture, and actually from a particular part of Scripture. Uh, every time he answers the devil, Jesus answers from 
Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 6 through to chapter 8. And uh, in Deuteronomy, what's happening is that Israel is poised, ready to enter the promised land. They've gone through 40 years in the wilderness. Notice the parallel there with Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness. And then after the wilderness years, God has made Israel into his people. He's constituted them as his chosen people by giving them the laws at Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments. And then in Deuteronomy, Israel is poised, they're ready to enter the promised land, and Moses goes over for them what it means to be God's people. And so now, in the wilderness, where Israel emerged from 40 years of trial and temptation, and where they were made God's people, Jesus arrives, and God's new people will be established. And it's all centred on Jesus who has just been declared the Son of God. And of course that phrase, that title, Son of God, was applied to someone before Jesus and before Israel. Luke's Gospel calls Adam the Son of God. And where he fails, Jesus succeeds. You remember Adam and Eve, they're in the garden, they're faced with temptation, the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden, the forbidden fruit, and the woman sees it and it looks good and it seems desirable for gaining wisdom and the serpent's words are ringing in her ears, did God really say? And so she takes the fruit and she eats it and Adam joins her in her disobedience. Satan's question was really questioning God's goodness. Did God really say... That fruit looks good. Are you sure God has your best interests at heart? And so Adam and Eve gave in to temptation. They doubted God's goodness. They took matters into their own hand and ate. Jesus succeeded where Adam and Eve failed. He resisted temptation. He trusted God to provide. As I was preparing this sermon, I was helped by a small article by an American pastor called, um, I'll get his name wrong, Thabiti Anyabwile. Can anyone contradict that? We'll go with that. Uh, He points out just how God-focused Jesus is in his temptation in the wilderness. Jesus quotes scripture. He says, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. See, Jesus is God-focused. He hangs on every word of God. God's word is Jesus' bread, all of it, every word. And Yabule puts it like this, every word, not a few words, not the words particularly easy to accept, not the words that make him popular. Our Lord Jesus read the Bible in order to live by every pronouncement his father made. Do we hang on every word of God? What do we need to change to be people who hang on every word of God? I may need to change my attitude as I read God's word so I'm not wondering whether it applies to me but how it applies to me. I may need to check my heart so I come to God's word not with a sense of boredom or weariness but an expectation that God will speak. We need to learn from Jesus how to hang on every word of God. Well, the first temptation was doubting God's goodness. The second is testing God's faithfulness. This time, the devil uses scripture against Jesus. We'll read from verse 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city, And had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. The devil takes Jesus to the holy city, to Jerusalem, in a vision, we think. And he has Jesus stand on the pinnacle of the temple. If you're really the son of God, I'm I'm paraphrasing, 
If you're really the son of God, throw yourself down. God will protect you. And this time the devil quotes scripture, Psalm 91. It would have been easy. Jesus knew that it wasn't time for him to die. He knew that he had a mission ahead of him. And surely God would preserve him for that. Wouldn't it be a good thing? Wouldn't it show the devil once and for all that Jesus really is the son of God? Maybe others would see and they would believe. But Jesus sees it differently. He answers again with scripture. And again from Deuteronomy, this time from chapter 6. We'll read it in Matthew 4 verse 7. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Don't put God to the test. Satan's use of scripture is wrong because it, it takes a little bit in isolation. Yes, God will care for his son, but there's more going on. There's a bigger picture. And Jesus knows that his mission means obedience. And instead of testing God, he has to trust God. When Jesus quotes here from Deuteronomy 6, he's pointing back to Israel's experience in the wilderness you remember the story. Israel, miraculously saved from Egypt, redeemed, bought out of slavery, led by God through the wilderness. And they grumbled. And they tested God. Exodus 17 tells of how in the wilderness, instead of trusting God to provide, they complain. Give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? Israel, the son of God, failed to trust God, just as Adam had failed to trust God. But Jesus trusted God. He resisted the temptation to test God. Again, with a hat tip to our friend, Mr. Anya Bwile, Jesus read the word of God not to test God, but to trust God. Facing Satan's temptation, he knew there was a significant difference between trusting God and testing God. One humbles itself under the word of God, the other humbles the word under our desires. How often do we come to God's word with a sense of doubt or suspicion or concern that maybe it won't be politically correct or if we hold to it, we won't be popular? Instead, we need to be like Jesus and read God's word, not to test God, but to trust God. The first temptation was doubting God's goodness the second is testing God's faithfulness. And the third, turning to false worship. Uh, look at verse 8 with me. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Again, this is a vision. Uh, no matter how high the mountain, you wouldn't be able to see all the kingdoms of the world. But the temptation here is to take the shortcut. Jesus knows he will receive all glory. He knows that the kingdoms of the world will be his. Is the cross the only way? Is it really necessary to suffer and die? But Jesus knows his path. Even from the beginning of his ministry, he knows that he came to live in our place and to die in our place. Without suffering and death, there is no glory. Well, Jesus is done with Satan and he commands him to leave. Verse 10, Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended to him. 
The temptation for us can be to put something else in place of God, to worship something else, to make a good thing the ultimate thing. But only God deserves that place. Only God deserves our worship, our heart, soul, mind and strength. And when we put something else in his place, it's because we don't trust God to provide. And so we turn to something else, whether it's the power of an important job or the fulfilment of family or the pleasures of the world. When we take a good thing and make it the ultimate thing, we take away from God. Notice again how totally focused Jesus is on hearing God's word. He quotes from scripture again. He reads the word of God carefully to make clear that God is God, to worship and honour him properly. Satan again tries to blow Jesus off course by misquoting scripture. He failed. But he must think he'll manage it with us. And so we've got to follow Jesus in reading the Bible carefully. So we remember that God is God. So our priorities are reordered. So we worship God properly. Where Adam failed, where Israel failed, what about us? Well, in all of this, though we try, we will fail. We know that we won't always resist temptation. Sin remains in us and we won't conquer it this side of heaven. But that doesn't mean we give up. It does mean we need a saviour. And the good news is Jesus is the saviour we need. This strange little episode in the wilderness shows us that Jesus is qualified, that he's got what it takes to be the saviour we need because he resisted temptation. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10 says this, In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. See, Jesus is the pioneer of our salvation and he was made perfect. Not in the sense that he was morally imperfect beforehand, he was always perfect in that sense. But he was made perfect. He was made fit for the job. He was qualified to be our saviour by his suffering and by resisting temptation. Through temptation and obedience, Jesus was fully qualified to be our saviour. And then a little further on in Hebrews, in chapter 4, verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathise with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. You see, Jesus' temptation is good news for us because we have the comfort of knowing that we have a saviour who can empathise with our weaknesses, who understands temptation and withstood temptation. And I think we can say that Jesus understands temptation better than any of us. You might think that sounds unlikely. After all, he was the son of God. Maybe he was tempted a little bit, but he couldn't have experienced the full extent of human temptation. Not like me. But I think actually he's experienced it even more than you and I because we often give in to temptation. He didn't. He saw it through. And so he's experienced temptation to an extent that we never will. The author Leon Morris puts it like this. The person who yields to a particular temptation has not felt its full power. He has given in while the temptation has yet something in reserve. Only the one who does not yield to temptation, who as regards that particular temptation is sinless, knows the full extent of that temptation. Jesus understands our temptation. 
he helps us in our weakness. And the conclusion that the writer of the Hebrews draws is this. Jesus was tempted but did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Jesus helps us in our weakness. Jesus did what Adam couldn't do. Jesus did what Israel couldn't do. And because he withstood temptation, Jesus alone is perfectly qualified to be our saviour. And Jesus calls us to obey him and trust him. He calls us to obey him, to resist temptation. We have the resources to obey. We can come to him for mercy and grace in our time of need. We have the resources of his spirit, his word, prayer, all at our disposal. And so Jesus calls us to obey him. And he calls us to trust him for forgiveness when we fail. You see, despite our imperfect obedience, we are right with God because of Jesus' perfect obedience. Let me say that again. Despite our imperfect obedience, we are right with God because of Jesus' perfect obedience. And that's the heart of the gospel. The good news of Jesus, the one who came to live in our place and die in our place. Let me pray. Father, thank you for Jesus who came for us. Please help us to obey. Help us to arm ourselves with your word so that when temptation comes, we're ready. And help us to trust Jesus so that when we fail, we know the forgiveness that comes from Jesus' perfect obedience. We pray in his name. Amen.